ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 120, Science Faction Electromagnetism. This one sounds a lot cooler. It does sound cooler, right? We decided, if you guys missed last episode, we have switched. We have gone through the entire periodic table of the elements. We're off the elements. We're on to the fundamental forces of nature. Uh, there's only four of those, so uh, we don't know what we're going to do after that. All I know, this isn't that pussy-ass gravity. That's right. And to the listeners, just a warning, you should put an aluminum hat over your head to protect from electromagnetic radiation while Absolute. you listen to this. And also, turn off this podcast, because this is the worst <laughs> type of electromagnetic radiation you'll ever be exposed to. Uh, it's the second of the major forces discovered after gravity. It's the force that dictates both electricity and magnetism. Up until 1873, electricity and magnetism were actually considered separate forces before Maxwell wrote his famous paper, A Treatise on Electromagnetism, a tome that is long considered the goblet of fire of the scientific world. <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, it selects the champions yes, of, exactly that. of the yeah. next tournament, of physicists? No, I meant literature-wise, the entire novel, A Goblet of Fire. It's, it's actually considered kind of the scientific version. <laughs> of that yes go jk uh it is way 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 stronger than that weak ass gravity that we learned about last week more specifically electromagnetism is essentially the physical interaction that happens between charged particles it dictates everything from how magnets work to how electrical fields work and how light works it keeps much of the natural world held together on the small level and is the basis for everything from generators and motors to the earth's magnetic field and electromagnetic radiation they can retract and repel unlike gravity each magnet has both a north and a south pole, and it always comes in pairs. There's no such thing. Right? Monopoles don't exist, Seb? Well, we've never found one. We, people, pay- that's, that's the goal, right? You want to have... Theoretically, many people think they do exist, but there's just so few we'll never detect one. And, and that would have an interesting impact on things like energy generation and stuff, right? Because monopole magnets can do things. You can do yeah, things with Yeah, but we would those. never find one. Sure. Ever. Some animals, like sharks, even make use of electromagnetic fields generated... Uh, in their own bodies to detect other living creatures' electromagnetic fields. That's how sharks and stingrays and stuff can find uh, other living things. And next week, we'll discuss its relation to one of the other fundamental forces of nature, the weak force, which also happens to be the working title of the Star Wars prequels. All right, guys. I, of course, am your host, comedian and archaeologist, Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing tonight? Doing great. I look forward to finding out why the weak force is misleadingly not the weakest of the forces we mentioned. Oh, and it is going to be an exciting tale. I cannot wait. Told by none other than our physicist, Mr. Seb Tawa. Seb, how are you doing today? Great. Feels like I never left. It does. <laughs> <laughs> we, of course, are broadcasting here from the Madhouse Comedy Club along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. Come on out here. It is a great club. There are some fantastic comedians coming to town. If you are ever in San Diego, drop on by the Horton Plaza Mall. Go up to the top level and check out at Madhouse Comedy Club. If you're never in San Diego, sit in front of your computer and check out our website, www.thesciencefaction.com. It's got a bunch of references to all the articles that we mentioned here and a bunch that we missed. We better get to it, though, because for now, we have science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, guys, very, very interesting. I love this first story because it's one of the rare instances of something that we call forgotten science. Not exactly forgotten, but it's about as close as you get. Now, we have all these things where people talk about, oh, the wisdom of the ancients, all this stuff. People had this advanced science way back in the day. That's almost completely false. There are instances where the Greeks discovered something and then it went undiscovered for the Middle Ages, like 1,000 years or 1,500 years, and we rediscovered it in the Renaissance. Fine, that's lost science. They rediscovered it. We're unlikely to discover anything from the ancient times that we don't already know now. That would be very, very difficult, scientifically speaking. However... Until Da Vinci's time machine is discovered yeah, that's next right. year. However, there is something we can do, which is look back to a time, maybe even 100 years ago or less, in which there was a technology that was burgeoning and starting to be used, but we stopped because we got a better technology. Now the better technology is having problems, and we might have to go back to that lost technology. Now that lost technology I'm talking about are bacteriophages. This is a virus that infects bacteria. Before we had antibiotics, believe it or not, this is how we treated bacterial infections. You got a bacterial infection, we don't have antibiotics to stop it from reproducing. We give you a virus that infects the bacteria that's infecting you, it kills it, you get better. We're bringing back leeches too. (laughs) 
That's right. And beatings. <laughs> it's the best medicine. Mercury pills. <laughs> You are far too rational, sir. <laughs> Take this. And the thing is, in other places, like certain Soviet bloc countries, they never even got antibiotics because of the way the Iron Curtain fell and because of everything that happened. And they kept using bacteriophages. So they've been using them for a long time, and they've still been very effective for them. Now, this is completely different from antibiotics. Our antibiotics basically emit chemicals that stop bacteria from being able to reproduce, and that kills them. It works on a wide range of essentially all bacteria that don't have resistance to that yet, and it works by stopping them from doing that. This is a whole different ballgame. This has, this has nothing to do with an antibiotic. This is going in and infecting that living creature and killing it from the inside out. Now, there are some problems. Unlike antibiotics, they're not as broad spectrum. You have to have that virus tailored to that bacteria. That virus will only go on that bacteria. It's for the same reason you can't catch your dog's cold, but another dog can catch your dog's cold. You wouldn't want to be trying to give them the wrong virus and it doesn't infect them. So you have to have the tailored virus for the thing. It's much less broad strokes. But think of what's happening right now. Think of MRSA. Think of antibiotic-resistant STDs. Think of all this stuff coming through. We can't fight it because our antibiotics don't work anymore. We've overused them. These bacteriophages, they will work because all you have to do is find the right phage that lines up to this bacteria, introduce it. It'll infect. It's happy as hell to go kill that bacteria. That's what it does for a living. We can use this for things like antibiotic-resistant infections that are killing people in hospitals. So because MRSA is such an asshole, we're abandoning the abstinence-only approach to dealing with the problem and using James Cameron's aliens that's to right. solve the problem. Send something else in that's bigger and badder. This what is going to use to kill the virus? A mongoose. <laughs> so because of the specific nature of the phages combined with the lack of understanding of their basic biology, it led to inconsistent treatment outcomes in the past, especially compared to things like antibiotics, which had very consistent treatment outcomes in the past before uh, antibiotic resistance. That was used by critics as a counterargument against bacteriophages, basically saying this isn't an effective treatment. Look, it only works 40% of the time. And they'd be like, yeah, but that was the 40% where we got the right virus. The other times people were just kind of being sloppy. So it is a very, very interesting, very promising field of biology, of immunology that might end up being the answer to this question of what do we do with MRSA? What do we do with these flesh-eating bacteria? What do we do with the antibiotic resistance that we've created with our misuse of, of antibiotics? But is it really worth dealing with Putin? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it sounds like a commie remedy. <laughs> hey, we used it too. Back before we had antibiotics, we used it too. Phages make you strong. <laughs> This is just an agenda to get Bernie Sanders elected, isn't it? It's exactly what it is. It's one of those commie plans. Damn socialist Nazis. Kremlin says vote Sanders. <laughs> well, here's another advantage. Think about it this way. If you got a new antibiotic, it's not like you can give it to somebody along with an old antibiotic, right? That's gonna, they're, you're going to have problems. You can only dose them for the antibiotic you're giving it to them. You have to give them to that one at that time with that dose. You can throw a bacteriophage in there. You don't have to dose this differently because this is a whole different thing it's doing. It's a virus going after it. So you're not worried about, oh, I have too much of this one chemical in my system or I have something that's going to hurt my, uh, my, the other bacteria in my gut because I'm taking too much antibiotics. No, this is just going after that thing. So you take your antibiotics just like you regularly would. You also take the bacteriophage. Now you can double team this motherfucker and get it out of there even quicker. Can we train viruses to go after viruses? Is there a hope for herpes well, you have survivors? To, you have to understand viruses, once they exhaust the actual host, they have no place to go. So once that virus goes through the infectious agent within your system, it can't infect your cells. It's a different species, way different. It just goes away. Like, it, it has nothing to do. It dies off. It kills everything it can, and then it dies. It's like locusts. But, but he's asking, could you do the same thing to get rid of viruses? I don't think so. I don't know. I'm not aware of any virus that infects other viruses. I don't know that that could happen because a virus doesn't have the cellular mechanism to reproduce other viruses. So Maybe we go to MRSA and say, the enemy of my enemy, <laughs> and we get MRSA to take out AIDS. <laughs> You're either with us or you're against us. It's the George Bush policy of medicine. Atheists aren't Americans. It also brings up some other good points, which is things like when you take antibiotics, you clear out not only the bacteria that's hurting you, you clear out the good bacteria you need to survive. You have millions and millions of different species of bacteria in your gut that helps you digest food, that helps you do a lot of things, that helps you survive. When you take antibiotics, you clear those out. That can cause serious health problems and cause uh, gastro problems. 
if you instead can just target the specific bacteria that's causing you problems and not touch the rest of them, you're way better off. But if I'm not taking antibiotics, I'm just looked at as weird for getting a fecal transplant. That's true. <laughs> that's true. It would ruin your huge hobby of fecal transplants, which happens after people will get their bowel system cleared out with antibiotics. They have to get a transplant of somebody else's feces so that they can kind of replant those bacteria in their own colon. So who donates their feces? Do you get paid for that? Yeah, you do. I could be getting paid every time I take a dump? Depends. I think they have some rule where you can't have taken any antibiotics within the last couple years or something like that. Well, that's fine. Yeah. Can't be Louis Anderson. (laughs) Uh, The other good thing, phages can be improved or trained, as it's called in Georgia, the shitty country, not the shitty state, during the early days to become more infective to the target bacteria. So basically, think of antibiotics. We keep producing it. The bacteria gains resistance to it because it's basically we're just producing an inert chemical. In this sense... We're producing a living organism that evolves with the bacteria, and so anytime the bacteria gets better, we can train it to get better, and we can take the best of the best of these viruses and through artificial selection very, very easily create one that's tuned and honed to, to knock out something much quicker than we can come up with a new antibiotic, which on average comes out about every 12 years, and we have none in the works right now to come up with a new one. And we've already seen resistance to the most current ones out. So this is kind of a big deal in terms of going after that huge hole that antibiotics is leaving us. And the other thing is we can find them almost anywhere. Phages are incredibly abundant throughout nature. They're found everywhere, and they have especially high densities in seawater, which makes it really easy to isolate new phages for clinical use. You just go around in your yacht like Craig Venter did, collect a bunch of seawater everywhere, and you come out and you're like, oh my gosh, I have a whole bunch of phages I can use to cure disease now. All right, that seems very plausible, but what happens when you run out of seawater? That's true. That is that is one of the major downsides <laughs> of this whole problem. Nobody's thinking ahead. <laughs> People currently right now can still travel to old Soviet bloc countries like Georgia and seek treatment directly at the phage therapy center. But otherwise, phage therapy is not yet a standard medical practice in Western Europe. Current research is focusing on developing good manufacturing protocols for prepping medicinal phage products that are safe for human application. So another thing you have to think of, obviously, you want to make sure whatever is in that vial is all the right virus because it only takes one copy of the wrong virus in that vial to be a problem for you. So when they talk about they have to have these medical standards down. In Soviet bloc Russia, if somebody gave you a wrong virus and you ended up dying, no big deal. No one's going to say anything about it. Here in the U.S. in 2016, if the FDA approves something and eight people die because of it, people are going to be fucking pissed. Yakov Smirnov thought it was a laughing matter, too. That's why you haven't heard of him. I mean, they'll be <laughs> pissed, but I don't think anything will happen either Either way. You have to, yeah, you, you just have to have much higher protocol standards. Yeah. So, when, And when we're talking about a whole new type of thing, this isn't just creating a new drug. This is a whole new market of viruses that we're sending out. You, you just need new protocols. It's a lot longer of an approval process than just coming out with a new antibiotic. So far, the double-blind clinical trials that compare the effectiveness of phages and antibiotics in treating burn victims are currently underway in France, and there's some really promising results from there. That may change the tide of research towards these phages. I've heard the way you tell the Russian phages versus the American phages. If you look under a microscope, when two of the Russian phages interact, one will get out of his car and bring out an axe and threat the other phage. That's true. And it's all caught on tape because they have to tape everything there. Too much insurance fraud, <laughs> Russian phages. So we do need something new, not just a new antibiotic, but a whole new disease-fighting concept like this to fight antibiotic resistance, especially the stuff that's popping up in hospitals. That's terrifying if you see that because they're, they seem to have no ability to stop some of those antibiotic-resistant MRSA infections in, that, that we've seen in some U.S. hospitals. And it could give us another line of defense against these infections. And good news for Damien, this will be huge in fighting antibiotic-resistant gonorrhea going, going on from here. I burned it off with a cigar. It's good. <laughs> That's not how gonorrhea works. <laughs> oh, then it hurts for nothing. Then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go on to our second article, Autism No More. This is a really interesting one. A lot of people saw this in the New York Times. A lot of people heard this guy on NPR. Uh, This all settles around John Robison, who's on the autism spectrum. He lived his life, grew up uh, with autism, married, had a life. Then he got interested in doing this specific treatment called transcranial magnetic stimulation. We've talked about it here before. We've talked about how people hack and do it themselves with a 9-volt battery at home off YouTube instructionals. 
Not a great idea, by the way. I wouldn't do that. But you are essentially stimulating your brain using electromagnetic fields that are outside your head, so you don't need surgery. But those fields can influence the brain, can influence the electrical flow in the brain, essentially stimulating parts, turning other parts off and on, and that kind of thing. So that we've used this for a lot of interesting things. We've used this to activate brains in interesting ways. We've used this to treat depression clinically. But now we're starting to use it to look at treatments for autism, specifically aiming at the frontal lobes, which affect empathy and how we interact with human beings and how we recognize emotion. We stimulate those and see what happens. So this guy, this, uh, so this guy John, he was in one of these clinical trials. Again, he's a sufferer of autism. He starts going through weekly transcranial magnetic stimulation sessions. He starts noticing that his empathy is way up. In fact, he's describing a situation in which he can't even have regular conversations with people because all of a sudden, he described a conversation where he was talking to a woman about her broken water pump on her car. And in any other day, he would have just gone, okay, broken water pump, I'll handle it and stuff. But he saw in her eyes like the worry and concern about that water pump and he had to excuse himself from the conversation and walk away because it was too overwhelming for him because he's not used to feeling this way. This is a whole new thing for him. Also, water pumps are very important because if you blow a water pump, your whole motor will go. I mean, the, you need to have that coolant going through. You can blow an alternator. You're just stuck by the side of the road. At least your engine doesn't blow up. She's statistically less likely to be able to change a tire on the side of the road. This is a drastic situation. <laughs> <laughs> he details this all in his new memoir, Switched On. And, and I like the idea that he had a sense of empathy he had never had before. But he describes it in negative terms. He describes it as losing a protective shield. Because now he would think back to all these things people had said and been like, oh, wow, that guy was making fun of me 25 years ago. And things or, people, or he might just be interpreting that. It could be. Yeah, he could get overly sensitive. I am have ruined so many jokes over my lifetime. Yeah. Now I know why PC people are so sensitive. <laughs> they They're suck. actually autistic. They, they've been activated suddenly, yeah. <laughs> and now I suddenly they think that. Well, he, yeah, he would think about that, and, and then he would go through life and be like, oh my god, people are making fun of me constantly. I never recognized this before. Like, I didn't have the social cues to recognize it, and now he does, and he's like, it's kind of sad. Like, I never once thought about that before. Now I do all the time. And I would say he's probably right. He's got more sure. information input, so he's if probably you don't making... care about people. Then yeah, you're never said. I think that's a, an interesting concept. Is this guy was walking around in what was essentially bliss, ignorance is bliss type bliss for the longest time, because he had no idea that people were making fun of him, that all this other stuff was going on, and he was just living his life and was very happy to do so. You turn on his feelings, and all of a sudden he has a completely negative reaction. I don't want to draw too many parallels. But I do remember a documentary I saw about a specific android who, when his emotion chip was put in, also had some interesting and wacky adventures. <laughs> yes, that You're was referring a, to Data, yes, the human I am, android. Of course, I am referring to Data, the uh, humanoid android who was very happy without feelings, did just well all on his own, had a cat and played the violin and everything. Then got human emotions introduced to him, and he couldn't control them whatsoever. He almost ended up letting Dr. Soong destroy an entire planet because well, of it. But he wasn't happy before he was just neutral okay functioning <laughs> he was yeah the least realistic part about that show is that people pretended to enjoy talking to data <laughs> pick the most autistic person you know and go three painless minutes without checking your watch the other thing that happened is he basically he he had a wife that was depressed which beforehand i well, love he this didn't have any feelings yeah i know right i love that before <laughs> this he like just didn't care that much he's like ah, oh, she's depressed whatever keeps going but once he had this happen the depression overwhelmed him because if you live with somebody who's depressed, it's bound to happen. Was she depressed because of shame due to her autism fetish? <laughs> uh, but he never noticed. But then he, once he got turned on, essentially, he noticed and it became overwhelming for him. And eventually they got divorced because he's like, I just can't handle this. I can't be sad all the time. So this his is crazy. Theory is correct. Yeah. <laughs> once his autism went away, she was like, fuck this guy. What if, and maybe he didn't account for this, what if he wasn't, she wasn't depressed before he got the thing? What if she was actually really happy before he had had the treatment? Then he got the treatment. He could feel emotions. And she's like, oh, I only took pleasure in him not being able to feel emotions. <laughs> this is horrible. And she fell into a deep, dark depression. He's understanding all the verbal jabs I'm giving him now because <laughs> I don't want to live in this world. I'm seeing a business opportunity. Damien's school for sociopaths. <laughs> My job is to kill that empathetic brain part. That has just been reactivated in formerly autistic people. I will give you back what you want. You're essentially Agent Smith offering that dude in the Matrix the <laughs> steak in order to betray Neo. He's going to get to go back in the Matrix, and he won't remember what it was like to be outside of it. That's what you're offering to these people. Yes, and I also have Lawrence Fishburne chained in my basement. You should have a dual one, by the way, where you both do the transcranial magnetic stimulation and then fix it. <laughs> you bring up a, an interesting point, though, because... 
if you can get rid or if you can give people empathy, right? So can say you get rid of it? No. Well, let's let's say you have like a serial killer, right? Now is it moral to put him in jail or something? So yeah, but he's just all you got to do is turn his brain empathy part on, right? That's interesting. And now he'll be a regular person, and putting him in jail is inhumane. Now that is really interesting, and I wonder how this would work with people who are diagnosed on the sociopathic psychopathy spectrum because. There is a difference. That's actually brain formation. I wonder if they would be able to, because there's an idea that autism is more of how the brain is interacting, and a lot of that can be the actual formation of the brain itself, the physical structure of it. So I wonder if they would actually still have the structures to be stimulated for that empathy. It would be interesting. That would be a good way to see where this goes in the future. Can you use this same type of thing that's having success with autism? And by the way, by success, none of the major studies have come out. This is one guy's account. So I don't want to blow this up out of nothing just yet because while some of the, the preliminary results suggest that what he is saying is applicable to other people, we have not seen the actual raw data yet. So this, this could be anecdotal. But if it does work with them, could it also work with sociopaths? Could it work with psychopaths? You heard it here. This is the type of podcast that will spend 10 minutes on anecdotal evidence. Yeah. <laughs> he also says, when I was able to see emotion, it wasn't just in my marriage. It was in the people all around me. And I saw the world was filled with angst and fear and worry. But, you know, the really hardest thing was seeing people that I had thought had been my friends and realizing they were laughing at me. And I thought we were all laughing at jokes. And I was the joke. Okay. Here's my point. We should all be more autistic. Every single one of us should be more autistic. It seems like it was fine. You know, you just tend to be like me. Just a little bit on the touch where you don't give that much of a fuck. But, like, you know, he, he's fine. He's in that place where he can function just fine. But now he's so sad for seeing the world as it is. To some extent, there's something nice about having the curtains pulled over the ugly well, stuff. Well, he was able to take a joke, and now he lost his sense of humor. <laughs> That's it. Imagine he's, if you were a girl and all of a sudden you had to remember all the bitchy situations from high school. And, that's right. And you were super sensitive. Like, I, I, he'd be dead if he was a woman. Right? Well, he says he can't even go to the movies anymore. He can't <laughs> watch TV. Ten years ago, he said, I could have sat through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre eating popcorn and wouldn't have cared. Now it's really upsetting and really stressful for me just to watch the evening news. I can't even do it. So think about that. If we could reverse your average person and make them a little bit more autistic, we might be a bit better off, right? On the plus side, he's Enya's biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I, like you said, this is a little bit anecdotal. We'll see what the follow-up studies come out with. But I just wanted to advise everybody out there listening, uh, be more like me. Embrace that autistic side. Be more like me. That's a good yeah. That's a good mantra. So you're saying if he wasn't so ashamed of his autistic side and was trying to, to reactivate parts of his brain, if he just hadn't accepted the way the good Lord made him... He'd still he would... be married right now, having a, having a great time hanging out with those dudes, fucking around with them. It'll be great. All right, guys, let's go on to everybody's favorite game, I Call BS. I Call... I Call... I Call... I Call... I Call... Ring, ring. I Call BS. You really abuse that everybody's favorite part. Not at all. This is everybody's favorite game. It is. They just published on it. It was in Nature. Anecdotally. Of course. This is I Call <laughs> BS. It's a game where I read four science articles, and my panelists compete to see which ones are true and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? I am ready to tie, which I consider it a win, <laughs> no matter what this bullshit rule. Maybe a life say. of considering ties wins are why you always lose. Maybe that's it, Damien. <laughs> you make You're the maybe for a tie. Yeah. You got to aim higher. Astronauts don't build muscle, Damien. You need to strain against something, and you're not even trying. Let's, let's just get this over with. <laughs> All right, article number one. A new study suggests that swishing and spitting energy drinks is an effective form of boosting athletic performance. Damien, is this science or bad science? Bad science. You are not swishing an energy drink. You are getting an enema with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, fair enough. And Seb? I'll say it's uh, bad science, but it's probably a psychological effect, so it's psychology, which is also bad science. <laughs> <laughs> All right, article number two. Even though it's more than 500 feet beneath the Earth's surface, scientists believe that the Large Hadron Collider is being impacted by snow and rain. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. It's being affected by the weight of all those damn immigrants from Syria. <laughs> Close the borders. <laughs> and Seb? Uh, I'm going to say it's science because there's probably not a lot of Syrian immigrants in, in Switzerland. It's very hard to immigrate into that country. <laughs> it's like, well, oh, only the best climbers. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Seb is buying into all the liberal media's bullshit. <laughs> If you think Switzerland isn't covered in Syrians strapped with bombs, you're a fucking moron, Seb. <laughs> Article number three. 
Researchers have accidentally discovered a battery with almost unlimited battery life. Damien, is this science or bad science? Before you answer, I do want to clarify, just so the audience knows, too. I'm not talking about a battery that never ran out of batteries. I'm talking about a battery that you can recharge nonstop, and it will always hold a full charge. It will basically stay as new as the day you bought it. As an Agent Smith-like character, this is clearly science. The human body is the battery that, until it actually dies, is never loses its charge. It's a Matrix joke. A I terrible, it. terrible Matrix joke. It was a terrible joke. That's I'll agree with you on that. <laughs> science, we win. <laughs> and so, but I'm going to agree that it's probably science. I don't see why that couldn't be possible. All right, and lastly, article number four: a new device released by Caltech Center for Engineering is a first of its kind pure energy generator, producing energy without any fuel or other energy input. It creates energy out of a complete vacuum. Damien, is this science or bad science? It says, bad science did not come out of Caltech. It came out of Billy May's labs. And the infomercial is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that is incorrect, Damien. It was the ShamWow guy. Okay, and Seb? Uh, yeah, I think that might be possible. Uh, oh. There's a thing called the Casimir effect in which you can demonstrate that there's energy in a vacuum. All right. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. A new study suggests that swishing and spitting energy drinks is an effective form of boosting athletic performance. Both of you guys thought this one was false, and this one is science. The study found that cyclists who rinsed a drink containing maltodextrin, a sugar, in their mouth for five seconds performed significantly better in one-hour time trials than cyclists who only rinsed with water. It is a non-reactive one, so you don't know the difference between water and this. You can't tell it by tasting it. But they had people uh, who were doing athletic performances put it in their mouth and swish it around and spit it out. They're getting a carb boost from it. And one of the ideas is that athletes might want to start doing this instead of drinking it if they're calorie conscious, if like they're boxers or MMA fighters and they don't want to, during training, waste calories. You just swish it around your mouth a little bit, spit out, and your performance seems to increase. Uh, I, I think their studies are probably tainted by doping in the cyclist industry. That's probably it. But wouldn't they be equally <laughs> doped? Both sides would be doped, Sev. Yeah. It would be a random trial. Your doped guy beat our doped guy, so your doped guy won. That's called the Tour de France. <laughs> yeah. Did Rockstar Lab say, no, our energy drink is the... Ours is the best. <laughs> Team Red Bull. Article number two... Even though it is more than 500 feet beneath the Earth's surface, scientists believe that the Large Hadron Collider is being impacted by snow and rain. Damien thinks this is false. Seb thinks this is true. And this one is science. Very, very interesting. They were noticing some distortions on the Large Hadron Collider. They did not know what it was. They kept trying. They're like, what is this? We have no idea why this is being distorted. They have measurements that are so precise, as Seb knows, that even the, the most minute difference is immediately noticeable. And so when they started noticing that there were these issues, this warping almost of the big loop that the Hadron Collider is made out of, it just – they couldn't figure out exactly what it was. But they noticed after a while kind of a correlation between heavy days of rain and snow – and this distortion and what they figured out we talked about gravity last week what they figured out is the gravity of the snow and water distorted ever so slightly the large hadron collider to a noticeable extent by the instruments and now has to be accounted for in their calculations when they're doing it i don't know why but that is the coolest thing in the world to me and i don't know why you're giving the syrians a pass <laughs> Honestly, think of it about a couple of, like some gallons of water and some snow have changed the way this device that measures subatomic particles functions. That's crazy. Sounds like lazy engineering to me. <laughs> Article number three. Researchers have accidentally discovered a battery with almost unlimited life. Both of you guys think this is science, and this one is science. Uh, most batteries can only be cycled around 4,000 times or so. The best might be high, as high as 7,000. But a researcher at UC Irvine was looking at batteries that utilize nanowires. Nanowires possess several ideal characteristics for electrical storage and transportation. They're highly conductive and much thinner than a human hair, which means they can be arranged to, to provide a large surface area for electron transfer. Unfortunately, nanowires are also very fragile, and they don't do well after repeated charging and discharging. So the researcher, whose findings are published in the American Chemical Society's Energy Letters, coated gold nanowires in manganese dioxide and cocooned them in a plexiglass-like gel. This combination keeps all the properties of the nanowires intact and makes them resistant to fractures. 
They then tried to see how it worked as a battery, and it was amazing. They could not get this thing to, to essentially lose its charge. They, they would charge it, uncharge it, charge it, uncharge it. Normally, you do that 4,000 times, the battery's dead. Best battery in the world you've ever seen that Elon Musk invented might go 7,000 times. This motherfucker's at 200,000 charge cycles and isn't showing any decrease in ability. That's amazing. The rabbit just keeps hitting the drum. Yeah. You can't get him to stop. <laughs> Think of that. Who knows what barriers exist to this technology, but if it does work, that would change the lifespans of our batteries and likely our digital devices completely. A phone, a laptop, anything could last for an almost indefinite amount of time relative to its potential use. So you're saying sell your Tesla stock. Absolutely. Or have him invest in this. This will be the next Tesla battery. (laughs) Elon Musk is an idiot. You're right. Hundreds of thousands of charges means that even the most frequently used cell phones would keep perfect recharging ability for hundreds of years. The downside, while you save money on on not buying a new device, your 87-year-old iPhone might have some trouble with the new OS. But other than that... (laughs) Other than that, that's amazing. You know, uh, we've talked about this before about how battery technology might get to this point where you, when you buy an iPhone, you'll never buy an iPhone battery. You'll just pull the battery out that you've had for the past 65 years and pop it in there. I mean, if you have a good enough battery, why not, right? Why get rid of it? If it has unlimited cycle charges, why not? They'll find a way to make you have to buy a new Probably. battery. Probably. Right? It'll get smaller or cooler you know, looking. The, the old one doesn't plug into the new model. Exactly. exactly. Coincidentally. And lastly, a new device released by Caltech Center for Engineering is a first-of-its-kind pure energy generator producing energy without any fuel or other energy input. Damien thought this was false. Seb thought this was true, which is surprising because I described a perpetual motion machine. This is, of course, false. (laughs) It does not and cannot exist. That is okay because the tie still means that it goes to Seb. (laughs) Congratulations, Seb, for once again whooping the living shit out of Damien. It is nice to be back in the back the way things are supposed to be. He just said a perpetual motion machine can exist. And he beats you in science. Isn't that bad? Anyway, regardless, very, very interesting. Great set. There was no article attached to that whatsoever. That was just a throwaway one. Oh, Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. That's the first time I've seen that. I was actually a... I'm not going to lie. I thought Seb would get that one. That was was kind of a giveaway to Seb. I was hoping Damien would lose. I think Seb saw that, was so chivalrous, he decided to give that one to Damien (laughs) while still beating his ass, which is an extra ass beating if you think about it. You just admitted to stack this game against me. It's been known for a long time, but you've never gone on the record till now. Damien, I stacked this game against you by inviting you to play. <laughs> that is that is stacking the game you against you. Son of a bitch. <laughs> All right, guys, let's move right on to Noble Nerds. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where we honor Noble Laureates, the world's most educated virgins. Welcome to Noble Nerds, where high school's unanimously voted most likely to stock tells you about other superlative people. Harold Urey was an American chemist whose work on isotopes earned him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1934 for his discovery of deuterium. Deuterium is one of two stable isotopes of hydrogen and has a variety of uses including nuclear weapons, nuclear reactors, and NMR spectroscopy a research technique that determines the physical and chemical properties of atoms or the molecules in which they are contained. NMR spectroscopy is an extremely useful technique, and I say this as a guy who was super disappointed that he was going to have to be researching this and not the butt camera procedure like he thought. During World War II, Yuri turned his knowledge of isotope separation to the problem of uranium enrichment. He headed the group located at Columbia University that developed uranium isotope separation using gaseous diffusion. The previous method for enriching uranium was both inefficient and extremely hazardous to Tony Robbins' health. So I have one question. Yuri speculated that early terrestrial atmosphere was probably composed of ammonia, methane, and hydrogen. One of his Chicago graduate students was Stanley L. Miller, who showed in the Miller-Urey experiment that if such a mixture be exposed to electric spark and water, it can interact to produce amino acids, commonly considered the building blocks of life. So my question is, where does the Miller-Urey experiment rank in terms of time science killed God? Is it full-on natural selection, or is it weak-ass Galileo shit? I think it's even bigger than that. I I have brought this experiment up. I'm shocked at how many people do not know about this. I think this should be, you know, more like Galileo dropping the apple from the Tower of Pisa type thing that everybody grows up hearing. Uh, The apple? 
I thought it was an you're apple. You're mixing them up with Newton. With Newton. Okay, there we go. Yeah, he drops stuff from the Tower of Pisa. Um, I, I think the thing that makes this so important is they took what at the time was thought to be the constituents of the atmosphere uh, in early life. The only thing they added was a spark, which you would get from lightning. So these are all natural phenomenon. And they produced amino acids in a short amount of time. We're not talking about they did this experiment for 45 years and they got it once. Within a few days, they essentially got this. And it's still going on a couple miles from this place. Miller, the Miller-Urey experiment is, is still sealed and technically going on at UCSD, just a few miles from where we're sitting right now. And it is an amazing leap forward in our understanding of biology and the potential of abiogenesis, which is life coming from non-life. And in this sense, we've seen amino acids, which are a very complex structure, form out of these base things. Now, you have all these amino acids floating around. They're still not a cell, right? They're still not even a protein yet. You still still have to group all these together to create anything that's going to be useful. However, if you imagine the early Earth is a place where all this stuff is floating around nonstop, you are covered in amino acids because we know that they, they produce themselves in this tiny little experiment. Why not in this whole big Earth? So you know this place is covered in amino acids. It literally just becomes a stats game. You know, when do they arrange themselves in this particular order so that they can extract energy out of their environment? That probably happens a lot. That's ha- that probably happened a bunch of times. When do they order themselves in such a way where the thing can actually replicate, create a copy of itself? That might have happened more than once, right? Where does it happen where the thing can extract energy from its environment and replicate itself? That's really the only step we don't that, have that is the self-replication. The, right. Because a few weeks ago we talked about uh, the guy who made a cell. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you could – uh, Craig Venture. Craig Venture. Yeah. Yeah, you can build a cell and put it together. Now, this is just saying, you know, can these arrange themselves statistically in a way that could eventually happen? And I think with the size of the Earth and the size, the relative size of amino acids, it's a statistical inevitability. Given enough time, these will arrange themselves in a way that's, that's self-replicating and can extract energy. Once that happens, natural selection takes over, and that will give you everything else. We know that all living things come from a single abiogenesis event that we know of. Life could have formed another time and gotten extinct or whatever. Every living thing that we know of on the earth, from a bacteria to a protozoan to a redwood tree to a fungal unit to Hulk Hogan, every single one of those things all had a common ancestor. We can trace all that back to when they had the last common ancestor and keep going back, back, back. What does that mean? It means this only had to happen once. We didn't have to have plants suddenly come out of nowhere and animals suddenly come out of nowhere and all this stuff. Life came from non-life, and then that one life became all the life we know. So abiogenesis is a huge missing piece of that puzzle, how that works. And this particular experiment was a huge step leading towards figuring that out. Uh, Super, super interesting science. We have done some more stuff since then that's very, very interesting. This is a 50-year-old experiment, right? 50 or 40-year-old experiment? Correct. Yeah, this is like a 50-year-old experiment. But... We've done a bunch of stuff in between then. Some ideas and concepts of what the atmosphere and makeup was or was around that time have changed. A lot of things have changed. We're still looking at this broad, this, this general idea. But it's such a huge and overlooked part of science. One of, my, one of the things that got me so angry about, uh, if you guys ever saw, there was a creationist movie that Ben Stein put out. The guy who you... Oh, yeah. Seen. I never saw it, though. Uh, part of it. One of the things that was so angering to me in it was he goes uh, he, he's trying to disprove evolution which is a hilarious concept to start with but in it in one of his arguments he goes uh, and in back in the 1950s Miller and Urey uh, got together to see if they could create could see if they could get uh, organic molecules from nothing and the experiment was a total failure and then it just kept going and I was like no it wasn't no it wasn't it's such a success what are you talking this is one of the most successful experiments in, in organic chemistry what are you talking about don't worry because Ben Stein narrated everybody was asleep that's right <laughs> three minutes in uh, but yes, I, actually, I think it is not only incredibly important in biology, I think it's incredibly important in science in general, and I would personally put it in the top ten most important scientific experiments of all time. What about you, Seb? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> but I would add that the Ben Stein movie is mm-hmm. a really good example of why documentaries are not really necessarily a good source of information. Yeah. Because you can say anything you want and call it a documentary. It's true. There's no supervision or peer review or anything all you have to do is say i made a documentary right as we learned a few weeks ago that anti-vax documentary that got into robert de niro's film fest it took a public outcry to get that kicked out so sometimes not only are documentaries bad sources of information but when you see a documentary with a bad source of information you can actually change whether or not somebody else sees that by getting mad enough and making enough noise which is what happened with that tribeca issue squeaky wheel gets the oil everybody thank you very much this has been noble nerds 
Thank you, Seb, for joining us for yet another episode of Science Faction 120. Thank you, audience, for coming out. Hopefully, you'll come on back next week and join us for Science Faction 121. The rapist Syrians are flowing into Switzerland. Some of them are okay, I imagine. I take that back. They're all rapists. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait, that's not right. Right.